all for coming. Clearly, this is a topic that, um, that draws some interest for us. Um, one of the things I'm happy to be involved in, both the Center for Community uh, Engagement as well as Rethinking Schools and the Writing Project, because I think one of the things about something like Common Core, which has emerged as a school reform without a lot of discussion in some quarters, and so um, I think that it's great that the uh, Center for Community Engagement sponsored and generously um, donated uh, funding to create this opportunity for people to have um, a dialogue with others about the um, about Common Core. And so thank you to Todd and Sherry for providing this space. Um, so I would like to um, introduce Stan Carr. Stan has, uh, Bill and I have Bill Bigelow back there, uh, editor of Rethinking School, and, and also my husband, um, have known um, Stan for exactly 25 years. And we know that because we were trying to count backwards from, well, how long have we been married? And we realized that it was right after the Lyle Conference uh, for the Co National Coalition of Education Activists, which is where we met Stan. And so right after that conference, we went on our honeymoon at Guanajuato, and Stan did not come along on that. <laughs> but we have known him from there. Stan um, was, a, was teaching at Kennedy High School then in Patterson, New Jersey, but he was covering the conference for Z Magazine. So we saw this tall, handsome man in the back taking notes um, and uh, wanted to know more about him. We in, were immediately drawn to his self-deprecating humor, his warmth, and also that, like us, he really saw, he really saw schools through the lens of a, um, of a classroom teacher. 25 years later, <clears throat> <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Sorry. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad you're not in my classroom. <laughs> That's what we really need a forum on. Okay, uh, Stan has cemented his reputation as one of the sharpest observers of corporate school reform um, agenda in the United States. Over the years, he's been a prolific writer for Rethinking Schools, and his irreverent, biting, Big picture analysis cuts through the dense jargon of so-called reformers. He has edited several Rethinking Schools books, including Rethinking Our Classrooms, Volume 1 and 2, and Rethinking School Reform. In addition to Rethinking Schools articles, his articles have also um, appeared in Education Week and Education Leadership, and in Valerie Strauss's um, Education Post blog, The um, Answer Sheet. Stan taught English and journalism at Kennedy for 30 years and now is director of the Secondary Reform Project for New Jersey's Education Law Center. One of the, um, one of the nation's most successful advocacy groups supporting the right of public school children to equitable, high quality education. Um, before I step away from the mic, I would like to say that there are two things that we will come back and just to kind of explain the agenda. Stan is going to talk for about 30 some minutes and then after that we know that people come to talk too. You have stories and you have questions. So after Stan's talk, the format is that we'll turn and talk to um, our neighbors about what our questions and tell our questions and our stories. And then we will come back to Stan for some answers. So that's kind of the, the general outline of the day. Um, this discussion that Stan's going to give today started when he was one of the key writers of an editorial um, by the same title in um, Rethinking Schools. And it got a lot of play. A lot of people um, liked the article and wanted to talk more about it. And uh, so if you didn't read the article that, there, that means you probably don't subscribe. So um, you should subscribe if you are interested in education, because what Democracy Now! does for the news, um, and Rethinking Schools does for education. And so, uh, if you want to be informed, that's one place to be part of the conversation. The other place to be part of the conversation is with a workshop series. The Center for Community Engagement is about community engagement in education. 
And the Center for Community Education has engagement, has a whole series of workshops on different kinds of educational topics that you can find, uh, some listed in the brochures or, or find us through those. And so I encourage you to sign up for some of those to come and be part of an ongoing, uh, an ongoing discussion and critique of contemporary school reform. So without further ado, Stan Carp. Thank you, I'm gonna do a Marco Rubio first. <laughs> The only thing for Marco Rubio I want to do. Um, I'm really tempted to talk about Bill and Linda's wedding, but uh, um, to uh, stick to the topic, uh, thanks to uh, Lewis and Clark, uh, thanks to uh, the Oregon Writing Project, and to the Portland Area Rethinking Schools for uh, the invitation. It's good to be here. I've come to Portland several times um, over the last uh, couple of decades, actually, to talk about the national debate about education reform. I remember coming first uh, to a conference here in the 90s that I think was actually held at Jefferson High School and sponsored by Fairtest about the growing use of uh, standardized testing. And coming back a few years later to a, another National Coalition of Education Activists conference that was about the search for common ground, which is not always easy to find between teachers and parents and community activists on school reform issues. And then I came back in 2003 to give a talk about No Child Left Behind when the law was first passed and when NCLB, actually before NCLB became uh, almost as unpopular as the Congress that passed it. <laughs> I returned again in 2010, soon after the release of the pro-charter propaganda film, uh, Waiting for Superman, to talk about the narrative of negativity that was swirling around public education and the teacher bashing that seemed to be part of it. In 2011, I went to Seattle, which people in New Jersey think is a suburb of Portland, <laughs> to talk about the challenging corporate school reform at the Northwest Teachers for Social Justice Conference, a terrific conference that I hope uh, a lot of you have a chance to go to next month. And now I'm here talking to you about the Common Core. And I've noticed that these visits are getting a little bit more frequent. And I worry somehow that this is a sign of some kind of approaching educational apocalypse. And that next year I'm going to be back here with a, a staff and a three-foot beard <laughs> talking about the end times for public education. <laughs> I exaggerate. A little. But I do start with these references because I think there's a direct connection between the topics of those earlier meetings, testing, NCLB, the race over the cliff, and the Common Core that we're here to talk about today. Because as I see it, the main trouble with the Common Core is not what's in these standards or what's been left out, although that's certainly an issue. But the bigger problem with the Common Core is the role that it's been playing in the larger dynamics of current school reform and education policy. Let me start with a list and then try to unpack some of the issues. The trouble with the Common Core standards includes the process by which they were created and adopted, the tests that are coming with them, the resource implications, the overhyped plans for what Common Core is going to be able to accomplish, the hurried and disruptive implementation timelines, the history of Common Core's origins as the fix for NCLB, and the problems that come with all standardization, uh, the problems of standardization rather, that come with all standards proposals. Now, you'll notice that I didn't mention the Tea Party's objections, that Obama Corps is an unconstitutional <laughs> plot to indoctrinate American students to accept the left-wing view of America and its history. <laughs> or, that was Phyllis Schaffley, actually. Or that it's the federal school curriculum of terrorist professor Bill Ayers. <laughs> My friend Ken Libby, who I think some of you know, has been cataloging the most off-the-wall claims of the growing right-wing opposition to Common Core. Uh, I think his favorite, uh, which he calls core spiracy. His favorite is the fear that Common Core seeks to kill cursive handwriting so that future citizens will not be able to read the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> He's actually found it. Now, if you saw my handwriting, you'd know that that's probably one standard I could get behind. <laughs> But today, everything about the Common Core is contested, even the name, the Common Core State Standards, 
because these standards were created as an instrument of contested policies. They are part of a larger politi uh, political project to remake public education in ways that go well beyond slogans about making all students college and career ready, whatever that means this year. And we're here today talking about the implementation of new national standards and tests in every school and district in the country in the wake of some pretty dramatic occurrences of the past few years. A 10-year experiment in the use of federally mandated standards and tests called No Child Left Behind that has almost universally been acknowledged to have been a failure. The adoption of test-based teacher evaluation frameworks in dozens of states, also as the result of federal mandates. Multiple rounds of budget cuts and layoffs that have led 34 of 50 states, including Oregon, providing less funding for education than they did five years ago, and facing the elimination of over 300,000 teaching positions. A wave of privatization that has increased the number of publicly funded but privately run charter schools by 50%, while nearly 4,000 district public schools have been closed in the same time period. An appalling increase in the inequality and child poverty surrounding our schools, categories in which the U.S. shamefully leads the world, and which frankly tell us far more about the source of our educational problems than the uneven quality of our curriculum standards. A dramatic increase in the cost and debt burden for college, you know, when I went to college many years ago, uh, college for all meant open admissions, free tuition, and race, class, and gender studies. Today it means cutthroat competition to get in, mountains of debt to stay, and mostly bleak prospects when you leave. Yet college for all is about to become the new AYP. And finally, we are discussing the Common Core amidst a massively well-financed campaign of billionaires and politically powerful advocacy organizations that seeks to replace our current system of public education, which for all its many flaws, is probably the most democratic institution we have, and one that has done far more to address inequality, offer hope, and provide opportunity than the country's financial, economic, political, and media institutions have done. <laughs> and yet we're in the midst of a campaign that seeks to replace that system with a market-based, non-unionized, privately managed system. I think many supporters of the Common Core don't sufficiently take into account how these larger forces define the context into which these standards are being introduced, and which will shape what Common Core implementation will ultimately be. As teacher blogger Jose Wilson put it, people who advocate for the Common Core state standards often miss the bigger picture that people on the ground don't. The Common Core standards came as a package deal with the new teacher evaluations, higher stakes testing, and austerity measures, including mass closings of schools. Often it seems like the leaders are talking out of both sides of their mouths when they say they want to improve education, but they need to defend, defund the schools that need it most. It makes no sense for us to have high expectations of our students if we don't have high expectations for our school systems. My own first experience with standards-based reform was in New Jersey where I taught English and journalism to high school students for many years in one of the state's poorest cities. In the 1990s, curriculum standards became a central issue in a long-running equity case called Abbott. That case began by documenting how lower levels of funding in the poor urban districts produced unequal educational opportunities in the form of worse facilities, poorer curriculum materials, less experienced teachers, and fewer support services. At a key point in the case, in an early echo of arguments that I'm sure will sound very familiar to you today, the governor at the time, Christine Whitman, declared that instead of funding equity, what we really needed were core content curriculum standards, and that we needed to shift our attention from the focus on the dollars to a focus on the standards that those dollars should be spent on, and that if all students were taught to meet the core content curriculum standards, then everyone would receive an adequate and equitable education. Now, at the time, the New Jersey Supreme Court was an unusually progressive and foresighted court, a status that has unfortunately been sharply eroded in recent years by our current governor, who you may have heard of, <laughs> one Chris Christie. I'd like to say that Chris Christie is to education reform 
as MTV's Jersey Shore is the culture. <laughs> But at the time, back in the 90s, the New Jersey Supreme Court responded to the state's proposal for standards with a series of landmark decisions that speak to some of the same issues raised by Common Core today. The court agreed that standards for what schools should teach and children should learn sounds like a good idea. But standards don't deliver themselves. They require well-prepared and supported professional staffs, improved instructional resources, safe and well-equipped well -equipped facilities, reasonable class sizes, and especially if they're supposed to help schools compensate for the inequality that exists all around them. They require a host of supplemental services, like high-quality preschool, expanded summer and after-school programs, health and social services, and much more. In effect, the court said that when you adopt high expectations curriculum standards, it's like passing out the menu from a fine restaurant doesn't mean that if you get a menu, you can afford to pay for the meal. And so the court tied New Jersey's core content curriculum standards to the most equitable school funding mandates in the country, which gave extra resources to the poorest schools, and which required many of the supplemental programs I just man mentioned. And while it's been a constant struggle to sustain and implement those equity mandates, a central problem with the Common Core is the complete absence of any similar credible plan to provide or even to determine the resources it would be necessary to have to make every student college and career ready as defined by the Common Core. Funding is far from the only concern, but it's a threshold credibility issue. If you're proposing a dramatic increase in outcomes and performance to reach social and academic goals that have never been reached before, and your primary investments are made in standards and tests that will mostly serve to document how far away you are from reaching those goals. You either don't have a very good plan or you're planning something else. Yep. Common Core, like NCLB before it, has failed the funding credibility test before it's even out of the gate. Someone recently sent me an article from, I believe, the Oregonian about a high school teacher in Clackamas. If I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Wait, where do you see what I do to Oregon? <laughs> she was a high school English teacher with 215 students, class sizes of 38 and 39. She was desperately trying to help her students pass the new state writing test. She calculated that every time she had signed an essay, it took her about 36 hours and 10 minutes of paper to respond. She was trying to imagine how she could possibly manage five essay assignments before the February test. Conditions like this are a plan for teacher burnout and student frustration, not college and career readiness. Last winter, the Rethinking Schools editorial board held a discussion about the Common Core. We were a little bit late coming to this topic, and we were trying to decide how to address the latest trend in the all-too-trendy world of education reform. The Rethinking Schools has always been skeptical of standards, especially standards that come down from on high. Too many standards projects have been efforts to move decisions about teaching and learning away from educators and schools and move them to bureaucrats and politicians. Standards have often codified sanitized versions of our history or our politics or our culture that reinforce official myths but leave out the voices and concerns of our students and our communities. Whatever potentially positive role standards might play in really collaborative conversations about what schools should teach and kids should learn has repeatedly been undermined by bad process, suspect political agendas, and commercial interests. But while all these concerns were raised, we also found it interesting that teachers in different districts and states were having very different experiences with the Common Core. There were teachers in Milwaukee, for example, who had endured years of scripted curriculum, basal readers, and mandated textbooks. For them, the Common Core standards seemed like an opening to develop better curriculum, and compared to what they'd been struggling for, under rather, seemed more flexible and even student-centered. And they think for many teachers, especially in the current interim between the arrival of the standards and the, excuse me, the rollout of the standards and the arrival of the tests, a lot of the Common Core's appeal is based on such claims, that it represents a tighter, smart of, a tighter set of smarter standards focused on developing critical learning skills instead of mastering 
fragmented bits of knowledge. That it requires more progressive student-centered teaching with strong elements of collaborative and reflective learning. And that it will help equalize the playing field by raising expectations for all children, and especially those suffering the worst effects of drill and kill test prep. And if you look at the standards just in isolation on paper, I think these claims can feel, seem very attractive. And our national union leaders are also mostly cheerleading for the Common Core. Recently, the NEA ran a headline, three out of four teachers support Common Core state standards. <laughs> You're late. <laughs> but when you look at the actual results of the poll the NEA was reporting on, it said 26% were wholeheartedly in favor of the standards. 50% supported them with some reservations, and 11% were opposed. And I thought, hey, this would have made a great Common Core assignment for my journalism students. <laughs> Write an alternative headline using the same data. <laughs> Instead of three out of four teachers support Common Core state standards, they could write, two out of three teachers think the Common Core standards will probably suck. <laughs> There was another recent survey that said 62% of the public had never heard of the Common Core Standards. And I fear that by the time I'm done, some of you may wish you were part of that group. <laughs> My point is that the debate around Common Core Standards is very confusing, especially if they are extracted from the policy, uh, the politics and the history that produced them, and from the tests that are just around the corner. The Common Core Standards emerged from the wreckage that was NCLB. In 2002, NCLB passed with overwhelmingly bipartisan support and was presented as a way to close long-standing gaps in academic performance. NCLB was a dramatic change in federal education policy. Away from its historic role as a promoter of access and equity by supporting things like school integration and extra funding for high-poverty schools and services for students with special needs. <laughs> It was a shift to a much less, more, much less equitable set of mandates around standards and tests, around closing or reconstituting schools, replacing school staff, and distributing federal funds through competitive grants to winners at the expense of losers. NCLB required states to adopt what it then called rigorous standards and to test students annually to gauge progress towards reaching them. Under the threat of losing federal funds, all 50 states adopted or revised their standards and began testing every student every year in every grade from three to eight and once in high school. Before NCLB, less than, 10, less than 15 states tested kids every year in every grade. After NCLB under federal mandate, all 50 do. The professed goal was to make sure every student was on grade level in math and language arts by requiring schools to reach 100% passing rates on state tests for every student in 10 subjects. This was a goal that was never going to be met from the day it was written, but it became the driving force for a decade of misplaced school reform. By any measure, NCLB was a failure in raising academic performance and narrowing gaps in opportunity and outcomes. But by very publicly measuring the test results against benchmarks that no real schools had ever met, NCLB created a narrative of failure that shaped a decade of attempts to fix schools while blaming the people who work in them. The disaggregated scores put the spotlight on gaps among student groups, but the gaps were used to label schools as failures without providing the resources or strategies needed to eliminate them. By the time the first decade of NCLB was over, more than half the schools in the nation were on the list of failing schools, and the rest were poised to follow. In Massachusetts, which is generally considered to have the most difficult and toughest state standards in the nation, arguably more demanding than what's in the new Common Core, in Massachusetts, 80% of the schools were facing NCLB sanctions. And this is where the NCLB waivers came from. As the number of schools facing sanctions and intervention grew well beyond the poor communities where NCLB had made disruptive reform the norm, the pressure began to reach into middle class and suburban districts to revise NCLB's unworkable accountability system. But the bipartisan coalition that had once passed NCLB had collapsed, and gridlocking Congress made revising it impossible. 
So Education Secretary Arne Duncan, with very dubious legal uh, justification, made up a process to grant NCLB waivers to states that agreed to certain conditions. Now making stuff up, whether it's a manufacturing <laughs> crisis of school failure, a non-existent STEM crisis, or a cabinet secretary's authority to waive federal law has become a frequent part of the corporate ed reform strategy. Forty states, including yours, were granted waivers from NCLB, which meant if they agreed to tighten the screws on the most struggling schools serving the highest need students, they could ease up on the rest, provided they agreed to use test scores to evaluate all their teachers, to expand the reach of charter schools, and to adopt common uh, college and career-ready curriculum standards. These same requirements were made part of Race to the Top, the program that turned federal education funds into competitive grants and promoted the same policies even though they had no track record, no evidence of success of school improvement strategies. Now there were other problems as well. Because federal law prohibits the federal government from creating national standards and tests, the Common Core sponsors made an end run around these obstacles by defining the Common Core project as a state effort led by the National Governors Association, the, chief, the Council of Chief State School Officers, and the Chief, a private consulting firm that had been created by the pre, those other two bodies. Provided hundreds of millions in funding, without which the Common Core would not exist. The standards were drafted behind closed doors by academics and assessment experts, many with ties to testing companies. Science Teacher and Education Week blogger Anthony Cody found of the 25 individuals in the work groups charged with drafting the standards, six were associated with the test makers from the college board, five with the test publishers at ACT, four were with Achieve Itself. There were zero teachers in either the math or that language arts work group. Yeah. The feedback groups had 35 participants, almost all of whom were university professors. He found one classroom teacher involved in the entire process on the review panel. Similarly, early ed uh, childhood educator Nancy Carlson Page reviewed the makeup of the committees, and she found that in all there were 135 people on the review panels for the Common Core. Not a single one of them was a K-3 classroom teacher or an early childhood profession. Parents were entirely missing, and K-12 educators were mostly brought in after the fact to tweak and endorse the standards and lend legitimacy to the results. But not only was the process of writing the Common Core of standards defined from above, in a sense, the substance of the standards was also top-down. To arrive at college and career-ready standards, the Common Core developers began by defining the skills and abilities needed to succeed in a four-year college. The Common Core test being developed by the two federally funded multi-state consortia at a cost of about $400 million are designed to assess these skills. And the policy claims made for what these tests are about to measure get extremely narrow. For example, in New Jersey, we are part of PARC, the Partnership for the Assessment for the Readiness of College and Careers. It's a mouthful. PARC claims that students who are in a college-ready designation by scoring a level four on its still information test will have a 75% chance of getting a C or better in their freshman composition course. Now this approach to defining college readiness depends on what my friend, educational researcher Michelle Fine, calls survivor studies. It depends on close examinations of the course and test taking patterns of the comparatively limited number of students who actually do successfully complete a four year degree. This vantage point may be one reason that many college and university educators have greeted the Common Core with enthusiasm. But taking the prior experience of successful college students as the only model to be studied and the experience to be reproduced does not come close to adequately addressing the diversity of learners and goals that public education serves. Like so many aspects of standards-based reform, one size will not fit all. Moreover, there is absolutely no evidence connecting scores on any of these experimental tests with future college success. And it will take much more than standards and tests to make college affordable, accessible, and attainable for all. 
Frankly, the idea that by next year, a Common Core test will start labeling kids in the third grade as on track or not for college is absurd <coughs> and offensive. Other substantive questions have been raised about the Common Core's tendency to push difficult academic skills to lower grades, about the appropriateness of the early childhood standards, about the sequencing of the math standards, about the mix and type of mandated readings, about the priority Common Core puts on the close reading of texts in ways that may devalue existing student experience and knowledge. But a decade of tests showed that millions of students were not meeting existing standards. And yet the sponsors of the Common Core concluded that the solution was tougher ones. And this time, instead of each state developing their own standards, the Common Core seeks to create national standards that will generate data from tests that are comparable across states and that can produce results that can be plugged into the data-driven crisis machine that is the engine of corporate reform. Now, if you had to buy federal mandates and impose them for a decade on every school, district, and state in the country, and you had gotten results that were massively unpopular and that contradicted both your original predictions and your premises, I'd like to think you might respond with a little humility. <laughs> you might actually refrain from coming up with another federally mandated plan for standards and tests. You might look at the 50,000 schools you had labeled as failures, the thousands of educators transferred, mislabeled, or displaced, the misdirection of hundreds of millions of education dollars away from local school budgets towards consultants, testing companies, and fly-by-night reform plans, and decide that maybe you should shift your attention to something that actually works, like universal childhood programs, yes. more equitable funding, restoring school libraries, or even getting rid of lead paint. But then you would not be Bill Gates, or Arnie Duncan, or Jeb Bush, or Michelle Reed, or Eli Broad, or sad to say, Barack Obama. The way that these standards are being rushed into classrooms across the country is only further evidence that is undercutting their credibility as serious reform. These standards have never been implemented in real schools anywhere. They're more or less abstract descriptions of academic abilities organized into sequences by people who have either not taught them or who have not taught this particular version of them. To have any impact at all, the standards must be translated into curriculum, instructional plans, classroom materials, and valid assessments. A reasonable approach to implementing standards like these would be to have a few multi-year pilot programs that provided time, resources, opportunities for collaboration, and transparent evaluation plans. Instead, we're getting an overhyped all-state implementation drive that seems more like a marketing campaign yeah. than an educational plan. Yeah. And I use the word marketing advisor because another defining characteristic of the Common Core is flat-out profiteering. Joanne Weiss, who was Arnie Duncan's, Duncan's former chief of staff and head of the department's Race to the Top grant program, described how Common Core is opening up new markets for commercial exploitation. Here's what she wrote. The development of common standards and shared assessments radically alters the market for innovation in curriculum development, professional development, and formative assessments. The market in formative assessments. Previously, these markets operated on a state-by-state -state basis and often on a district-by-district -district basis, but adoption of the common standards and shared assessments means that education entrepreneurs will enjoy national markets where the best products can be taken to scale. Now, when you and your colleagues get together to talk about innovation in curriculum development, how many of you conjure up visions of education entrepreneurs enjoying national markets where the best products can be taken to scale? Somehow, I don't think this means that Linda Christensen's books or the units that you created at the Oregon Writing Projects Institutes are suddenly going to get national distribution from the Gates Foundation. Instead, having financed the writing and creation of the standards, the Gates Foundation has entered into a partnership with Pearson, the test publisher, to produce a full set of K-12 courses 
aligned with the Common Core that will be marketed to schools throughout the country. Nearly every educational product now comes wrapped in the Common Core brand name. If you're crazy like me and you have a subscription to Education Week, count the number of times it says Common Core in your next issue. If it was a drinking game, you wouldn't make it past the second <laughs> next year. The curriculum and assessments that our schools and our students need will not come from this process. Besides the straight up, straight up profiteering, the politics swirling around Common Core have put schools at the center of what Politico, the news, Politico, the news site, said this week was the Common Core money war. This is what the reporters of Politico told the national press about Common Core. Tens of millions of dollars are pouring into the battle over the Common Core academic standards. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has already pumped more than $160 million into developing and promoting the Common Core, including $10 million in just the past few months. It is getting ready to announce another $4 million in grants to keep the advocacy cranking. Corporate sponsors are pitching in too. Dozens of the nation's top CEOs will meet to set plans for a national advertising blitz that will include TV, radio, and print ads. And on the other side, opposing the Common Core, is an array of organizations with multi-million dollar budgets of their own, and a lot of experience in mobilizing crowds and lobby lobbying lawmakers, including the Heritage Foundation, Americans for Prosperity, the Pioneer Institute, Conservative Women for America, Freedom Works, and the Koch Brothers. If you needed any more evidence that the debate over the Common Core is part of a much larger struggle over who will control education policy, corporate power and private wealth, or citizens managing, however imperfectly, a public institution in a democratic process, there you have it. While that larger battle rages, the most immediate threat for educators and schools is probably the tests. Secretary Duncan, who once told us that Hurricane Katrina was the best thing to ever happen to New Orleans schools, and that waiting for Superman was a Rosa Parks moment, oh. now tells us, I am convinced that this new generation of state assessments will be an absolute game changer in educate, public education. It does like games. I think it's a game changer, too. The problem is the game, like the last one, is rigged. While reasonable people can find things of value in the Common Core standards, there is no credible defense to be made of the useless plan for these tests. And the Common Core project threatens to reproduce the narrative of public school failure that just led to a decade of bad policy in the name of reform. Rick Hess, one of the sharper conservative education pundits, recently described this game-changing plan. He wrote, I'm mostly told that it's going to finally shine a harsh light on the quality of suburban schools, shocking those families and voters into action. This will apparently entail three steps. First, politicians will actually embrace the Common Core assessments, and then will use them to set cut scores that suggest huge numbers of suburban schools are failing. Then parents and community members who previously liked their schools are going to believe the assessment results rather than their own lying eyes. Finally, newly convinced that their schools stink, parents and voters will embrace reform. And this conviction has become the happy Kool-Aid that allows would-be reformers to ignore the fact that they're not actually offering to tackle the things that suburban parents care about, like adequate funding and music programs and art programs and small class sizes. Reports, though, from the first wave of Common Core tests are already confirming these forecasts, at least in terms of the results of the test, if not the reaction of the parents. Last spring, parents and teachers in New York schools responded to the new Common Core test developed by Pearson with outcries about their length, their difficulty, and their inappropriate content. Pearson had included corporate logos and promotional material in the test passages. <laughs> Students reported feeling overstressed and underprepared meeting the test with shock, anger, tears, and fear. Administrators actually requested guidelines for how to handle tests that students had vomited on. Teachers and principals complained about the disruptive nature of the testing, and many parents encouraged their kids to opt out. Yes. Uh, 
Unfortunately, many of the kids who were opt out were automatically placed in summer school because the scores that were used to promote them were not on their rest transcripts. Only about 30% of the students were deemed proficient based on arbitrary cut scores that are designed to create new categories of failure. The achievement gaps that Common Core is supposed to narrow exploded on the new test. Less than 4% of the English language learners passed the test. The number of students identified by the test for academic intervention skyrocketed to 70%, far beyond the capacity of districts to meet. Now, from what I can tell, your own education department here seems to be preparing for a similar policy-made panic. Commissioner Rob Saxon, according to an article I saw in the paper, predicts that in two years, when the state completes the shift to Common Core, only about 30 to 45 percent of the students will pass. What do you expect the results like that to produce? These tests are on track to squeeze out whatever positive potential exists in the Common Core. The arrival of the test will preempt the already too short period that teachers and schools have had to review the standards and to develop appropriate responses. Instead, that space will be filled by the assessments themselves. Instead of reversing the mania for overtesting, the new assessments will extend it with pre-tests, yep. interim tests, yep. post-tests, and computer-based performance assessments. We will again see the difference between giving a patient a blood test and draining the patient's blood. <laughs> the scores are going to be plugged into data systems that will generate value-added measures, student growth percentiles, and other imaginary numbers for what I like to call psychometric astrology. <laughs> this inaccurate and unreliable practice of using test scores to evaluate educators is going to distort the assessments before they're even in place. And it has the potential to make Common Core implementation part of the assault on the teacher profession instead of a renewal of it. If the Common Core's college and career ready performance level becomes the standard for high school graduation, it will push more kids out of high school than it will prepare for college. The most vulnerable students will be the most at risk. As Fairtest put it in a recent fact sheet that should be posted in every teacher room in the country, if a child struggles to clear the bar at five feet, she will not become a world-class jumper because someone raises the bar to six feet and yells, jump higher. <laughs> or if her poor performance is used to punish her coach. The cost of these tests, which have multiple pieces throughout the year and must be given on computers that many schools don't have, will be enormous. And it will come at the expense of more important things. The plunging scores will be used as an excuse to close more public schools, to open more privatized charters, and voucher schools, especially in poor communities of color. Mm -hmm. This is not just cynical speculation. It's a reasonable projection based on the history of the last 10 years, the dismantling of public education in the nation's urban centers, and the appalling growth of the inequality and concentrated poverty that remains the central problem in public education. Common Core has become part of the corporate reform project that's now stalking our schools. As, a, as we struggle with these new mandates, we should defend our students, our schools, and ourselves by pushing back against implementation timelines and plans that set schools up to fail, by resisting the stakes and priority given to the test, and exposing the truth about the commercial and political interests shaping this false panacea for what our schools face. But before I open it up to discussion about how we're going to do this, let me end with some signs of hope that the movement we need is indeed starting to grow. Yeah. Next week, parents in upstate New York are organizing a Send the Scores Back campaign. <laughs> They're returning their children's scores to the State Education Commissioner, John King, with a letter declaring this year's scores are invalid and provide no useful information about student learning. They're sending the score sheets back with a letter that details the many flaws in the construction and scoring of these tests. A few days ago, Jeanette Duderman, an elementary school parent from Long Island who is now the spokesperson for a 10,000 member strong Long Island opt-out group, gave this stirring testimony to the New, Jersey, New York State Senate Committee. The testimony is in Valerie Strauss's answer sheet if you want to read the whole thing. She said, this needs to end, and we cannot afford to wait. Parents have been backed into a corner. 
We allow changes to happen in our schools through this reform movement without realizing the damage that was to come. Many have said that these reforms will fail by their own right, but by then the damage to my children will have already been done. My 10-year-old is already counting the years he has left before he will no longer be forced to go to school. College and career ready will be of no use to the tens of thousands of students who will burn out long before their college days are here. Inferior teaching to the test practices that dominate the school year are a direct result of tying student scores to teacher evaluations. Through this reform movement, the education system of New York, which was once a source of pride for teachers, parents, students, and citizens, is now one of fear, anger, and humiliation. The movement to end high-stakes testing is growing rapidly. I've had close to 1,000 new members join in just the last few weeks. We are committed, we are organized, we are not going away. Yes. Right. And finally, <laughs> and finally on the plane ride here yesterday, I started to read Diane Ravage's new book, Reign of Error, which I hope all of you will pick up. This is an authoritative, voluminously documented critique of current reform policies that she herself once helped to promote, but has come to see as a threat to the very existence of public schooling. Here's how she ends her book. Yes, we must improve our schools. Start now, start here, by building the bonds of trust among schools and communities. The essential mission of the public schools is not merely to prepare our workers for the global workforce, but to prepare citizens with the minds, hearts, and characters to sustain our democracy in the future. Genuine school reform must be built on hope, not fear. On encouragement, not threats. On inspiration, not compulsion. On trust, not carrots and sticks. On belief in the dignity of the person, not a slavish devotion to data. On support and mutual respect, not a regime of punishment and blame. To be lasting, school reform must rely on collaboration and teamwork among students, parents, teachers, principals, administrators, and local communities. Despite its faults, the American system of democratically controlled schools has been the mainstay of our communities and the foundation of our success. We must work together to improve our public schools. We must extend the promise of equal educational opportunity to all the children of our nation. Protecting our public schools against privatization and saving them for future generations of American children is the civil rights issue of our time. sent out to school boards all over the state. Yes.